I love how we just get after it in worship, you know, on songs like that. It's like amazing. I sit there and I'm like, wow, this is incredible. Maybe I shouldn't even preach. And then I think, no, I should preach too. I'm going to go ahead and do that. But it's just awesome. So thanks for just leaning in with your whole heart and just going for it. It makes such a difference. There's something so special when we join in church and we get together and there's thousands of us singing really around our entire city. So many great churches in our city, such a great joy uh, to be able to, to just worship together. I want you to turn to the book of Romans, if you got your Bible, Romans chapter 8, and welcome Sienna in Cyprus and downtown and Digital Family as well. Cyprus, I'll be with you tonight as we have the Shane and Shane concert. It's sold out in Cyprus tonight, which is going to be great, and so I'll be with y'all later on this evening. But we're in Romans chapter 8. Hopefully your Bible is just falling open to Romans at this time, because we've been in there for the last few months. Romans, they say this, a man back in the 1600s, a pastor, he said, if the Bible was a ring, Romans would be the diamond, and Romans 8 would be the glisten on the diamond. So that's where we are in Romans chapter 8. To just refresh your memory, Paul is 52 years old, right about writing this book of Romans. So that's my age. So he's 52 years old. It's about 57 AD is when he's writing this, thereabouts. He's going to get to Rome in 60 AD, but he's sending this letter to the Romans, to the believers there that are right in the middle of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire wasn't like just cheering Christianity on. So here he is sending this letter saying, I want to give you some things. And what he's going to do today is we're going to see he's going to give us some anticipation for heaven, that we should get excited here at Christmas about Jesus being born, that that ensures heaven as he goes to the cross, he rises from the grave, and we are ensured heaven as believers in Christ, placing our faith and trust in him, that we can be assured heaven. So Paul is going to get us ready for anticipation. Now, anticipation, we'll see it in the scripture, but it's also a great word for this time of year because some kids are anticipating some presents right now. They're getting excited about it. They're beginning to shake the boxes underneath the tree. They're looking in the back closet, trying to find some Christmas gifts that hasn't been wrapped yet. Now, adults, we're anticipating a humongous credit card bill in January. That's what we're anticipating. But the kids are anticipating a lot more fun with that. And so we're going to see the anticipation of heaven. I remember as a kid anticipating Christmas morning, wanting it to come. And we're going to see in this series, Christmas gifts from heaven some great things that God has for us. I want you to look in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. That's where we're going to start. We're going to make it all the way to 25, but we're going to start with verse 18. Now, this is a verse that you should memorize, okay? I know all of us feel like we're bad at at memorizing Scripture, but this is one you should star, highlight, underline, have memorized in your heart and your soul. So here it is in Romans chapter 18. It says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Let's stop right there. I memorize it like this. I consider that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that awaits. That was the version I memorized it in. But here we have it in the Christian Standard Version. And what he's giving us is a comparison. There's a comparison of planet Earth, and there's a comparison of the glory that awaits in heaven. So that there's an anticipation from the trials of earth to the glories and the greatness of heaven. Here's your first Christmas gift. Embrace the gift of perspective. Embrace the gift of perspective. Paul's wanting us to get a perspective. Now, at some point, you're going to buy something online and some online sites they have where you can, you got 30 different versions of this product that you're going to buy. And it'll say, would you like to compare? And you can click a little box and get maybe three or four of them next to each other to say, okay, which one do I want? And you can compare them. Paul is checking the box of earth and checking the box of heaven. And he's saying, I want you to consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that waits in the future. He wants us to embrace perspective. Paul knew suffering on a first name basis. I mean, he was lowered in a basket across out of the wall because people were wanting to kill him. He was shipwrecked. He was whipped. He was beaten. I mean, Paul, one of his best friends was a doctor named Luke because he was in so much trouble. He had to get a doctor as a best friend. I mean, Paul, everywhere he went, it was a riot or a revival. That's what happened with Paul. One of the two things. So Paul knows suffering greatly. And he knew that suffering is a normal part of the landscape of life on earth. Suffering's just a part of it. 
And I think some of us, we don't realize that there's always ants at the picnic. Do you know that? You gotten there yet? In life, there's always ants at the picnic. You can have everything right, and there's always going to be a mosquito in Houston, or there's going to be an ant, there's going to be something that happens. Life is not perfect. This is a broken and fallen world. And I think when we're young, we don't realize that. We kind of think, oh, once I do this, then everything will be perfect. Well, then once I do this, everything will be perfect. And finally, you get old enough and mature enough that you go, life's not perfect. There's suffering in this world. There's pain in this world. And it might be that you're mature in age, but you're not mature in emotions. And you keep waiting for other things to happen. It's a hard place to live. This is a suffering place. So we have to realize that that suffering is just a part of it. What does James say? He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith will produce endurance so that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Why do I have that memorized? Because there's trials in life. And so we've got this suffering is going to be a perspective change that God is using it in our lives. We don't like it. We don't want it. But he's using it in our lives to give us perspective that he is at work and he wants to work in us as well as through us. So we have to assign the proper value to the circumstances that we're in. doesn't mean it's fun. It can be very, very painful. But don't Forget to compare it to the glory that awaits. There's jewels on your crown for suffering well and letting God do his work through you. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. I'll put it on the screens as well. Therefore, we do not give up even though our outer person is being destroyed. Our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely comparable eternal weight of glory. Do you hear a comparison? Comparable incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Paul is saying, I want you to get perspective that life has pain, life has sickness, life has disease, life has things that are bad and good. And there's in our hearts though, we can say, Lord, we trust you that you are at work as well. I have this little book in my office, and I like older things. History is kind of fun to, to look at. And this is the 1941 Street Guide of the City of Houston. It's so 1941. So Cypress and Siena, none of your streets even exist at this time, all right? Now, loop, the loop didn't even exist. Where we are right now doesn't even exist at this time. The furthest that you could go would be like Memorial Park to the west, and navigation to the east, so like Nipah's on navigation, don't you want a fajita? And so you could go over there. That'd be about as far as you're going to get there. Couldn't go very far south from downtown. Couldn't go very far north from downtown. It gives you perspective. And in this book, this little book here, it's got uh, four-digit phone numbers also in Houston, Texas. And it's got this map. That's like, I feel like it's a treasure map, like that I'm unveiling here, this, this old map here of the city of Houston. Now, if you were to take this map and I was to tell you, you need to go such and such, so and so place, you couldn't find your way around. Your street wouldn't even exist. You wouldn't even know what was going on. Now, this is a map of the 1941 Houston, but what do we use? We use this as our map now, don't we? This is what we're using. And it'll tell us which way to go. You can follow on ways. You can exit here. You can go there. You can cut through a neighborhood when you should be on the freeway. You can figure out all different things. You can put in exact time you should leave, how long it's going to take you, where there's trouble, where there's traffic. And so this is the map that gives us a perspective. You get in your car now and you've got one of those maps on your phone and you plug it in with Apple CarPlay or whatever, and you connect and you can see the GPS. You put your car in reverse. You got a perspective now of a camera that you're going backwards and you can look and see through the camera. I got in a car with a friend as a Tesla the other day. I was like watching a movie. They, they were showing what's to the side of me. To the, luckily, he was driving. I was like, wow, look at this thing. I mean, perspective, absolute change. And how many of us are going through our trials with a 1941 map? Instead of allowing God... That's good. I like crowd participation. That's awesome. He owns a Tesla is what he's doing. He, we're going through trials with this, aren't we? 
And we don't realize God's given us a gift, a perspective, a real perspective. And we're going through trying to figure it out. Lord, I don't know why I'm on this road. It doesn't even exist. Lord, I don't know why you did this. I don't want this. And we've got to regain the perspective that Paul has to say, Lord, we want to operate with your perspective, with you, God, in the mode of telling us what's really going on. So he gives us the perspective. And then secondly, look at what happens in verse 19. He's going to give us another gift. We're going to get some other Christmas gifts. Here we go in verse 19. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation, there's our word, for, the, for God's sons and daughters, that's believers in Christ, to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility. There's always ants at the picnic. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope, hope's going to be like five or six times in this passage of Scripture, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children, that we would really put our eyes on heaven and walk with Jesus. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, here's our next Christmas gift. We have to, number one, embrace the gift of perspective. Number two, we have to understand the gift of frustration and anticipation. Now, that's a weird sentence, isn't it? To understand the gift of frustration. Frustration is a gift. What are you talking about? Frustration, follow me, on earth leads to greater anticipation of heaven. It says that the world has been subjected to futility in hope that we would negate the decay and be the children of God, that the frustrations that we go through, and there's a lot of frustration that those frustrations would be a gift that would give us greater anticipation to being in the gift of heaven. Now, my grandmother, I remember talking to her uh, before she passed away and I was talking with her and she was talking about how she was ready for heaven. And I was in my young 20s and I was like, ready for heaven? I mean, no way. I haven't been married yet. Dear Jesus, don't come back yet, please. No heaven yet. There's so many things I want to do. When you're young, you're like, I don't, I don't, the worst thing that could happen would be Jesus to return or me to go to heaven, right? I want to do some other stuff, which is a bad perspective. And that's a sermon for another day. But she's like, I'm ready for heaven. And I said, you're ready for heaven? And she said, yes, I've got more friends in heaven than I do on earth. Death, grief, the frustration of the world of always having ants at the picnic. She wanted to be in heaven where cancer is over, where death is gone, where trials and tribulations have ceased, where the chaos of the world is over and God is there and she's connected with him, seeing him face to face. How incredible is that? The frustration leads to the anticipation. And when you get really excited about heaven, it's when you realize that earth doesn't really hold much. Heaven holds it all. Now, are we to make a difference here on earth? Of course we are. That's what it talks about, the revealing of the sons of God. I'll tell you about that in just a second. But it says that there's groanings. Now, if you're a note taker, and I hope that you are, there's three groanings in this passage of Scripture in chapter 8. The first groaning is in chapter 8, verse 22, and that's the groaning of creation. All of creation groans at the fallenness of this world. In verse 23, there's the groaning of the believers, that we as believers, we groan because we know this is not the world God intended it to be. And then in verse 26, there's the third groaning. This is the groaning of the Spirit. And we'll talk about that next week, that He groans with groanings too deep for words. And so there's three groanings because we can look at this world and go, this is not the Garden of Eden. This is not how it's supposed to be. Do you feel in your heart a groaning, like a, ah, you go through heartbreak, when you go through grief, oh, you just groan. It's a terrible feeling. Well, I want us to just get it out of our system, okay? We're just going to, we're going to groan together is what we're going to do. I'm going to have all of us just in unison, every campus, digital family as well, we're all going to groan together. So here's what you can do. You can throw your head back, you can throw your head to the side, but we're all going to go, ah, all together. Okay, ready? Count of three. One, two, three. Ah. 
that was so loud. Y'all needed that. It's awesome. So now I'm going to give you a few things, just some funny little things along the way. I know there's deep, deep, serious groanings, but I'm just going to give us some groanings. And we're just going to, I'm going to say it and I'm going to point at us and we're just going to get it out of our system and we're just going to groan. Okay, ready? Here we go. It's going to feel so good. It's going to be like a counseling session for you. You're going to feel like you just got a massage of the soul. It's going to be awesome to work all those knots out. Here we go. Going through the drive through only to get home and realize they forgot the French fries. Two minutes left and your team is driving for the winning touchdown and the running back fumbles. Or I could say it like this. You had the best recruiting class and you ended five and seven. I hear you. Amen. Amen. A quick trip to the mall, but there's no parking. That last bite of spaghetti ends up on your new shirt. The last and final one that you have here, you finished the most amazing email or text ever written in history, but somehow it won't send or it's deleted. Ah, oh. uh, it's terrible, isn't it? Groanings. Ah, uh, we just see it. We, I hit print and the printer doesn't work and there's no paper. Ah, uh, it just goes on and on and on, right? We just make a list. And those are the ones that are really no big deal. There's a lot deeper ones we could get to, aren't there, that would just be a groaning of the soul. You just weep your eyes out and you just don't know anything to do but just groan in the middle of the night at the fallen world that we're in. We turn on the news and we just groan. Oh, so many things wrong. And yet that groaning is to bring a frustration that the groaning then says in hope that we come then with anticipation, God, we need you. God, we need your inclusion here on planet earth. God, we long for heaven. God, we wanna share the gospel with people. It's an amazing thing in this, this groaning. He gives us this verse right before the groaning in verse 19. It says, for creation eagerly awaits and that's a, a Greek word that's used seven times in the New Testament, always talking about the return of Jesus Christ, eagerly awaiting with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. It's a revelation. It's apocalypse is what the, the Greek word, we would get that word from, to be revealed. So what he's saying is in this groaning that there's a revealing of the people of God, watch, I'm going to bring it together, who are sharing the gospel of light in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the groaning, believers in Christ, the church steps forward and says, I know your pain is deep and he took the cross for you. I know this world is dark, but there's a light in a city set upon a hill and it's waiting for something to be revealed. What's gonna be revealed? Well, the revealing is the believers in Christ that have trusted in Jesus Christ, that have the Holy Spirit in their heart, that have compared the world to heaven and chosen heaven. Those believers now are revealed to the world to be able to share Jesus Christ and to share the gospel and to be the light. That's incredible. That's hope. That's powerful. And so I want to just declare to you as a believer, if you're not a believer in Christ, there is something greater, there's something higher, there's another story, and it's the story of Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus as a baby born in the manger, living a perfect life, dying a cross that was prophesied, crucifixion was prophesied in Psalm 22 before it was even invented by the Romans. He dies on a cross, rises again from the grave so you could trust him and the Holy Spirit could live in your heart and you could be a believer in Jesus Christ. How incredible is that? Well, I get to reveal something to you today. We've been in this initiative called kainos, the Greek word for new. And if you've been around here, you've heard that word a lot. If you haven't, it's a two-year initiative to do some new things where we increase our generosity and we're a year in. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a midpoint commitment time. We turned in midpoint commitment cards. Some said, we're stepping it up. Some said, we're holding true to what we've, we've committed. Some said, you know what? I'm not a part of this and I don't wanna miss out on this fund. So I'm jumping in because I wanna be a difference maker as well. And so we totaled all those things up and I get to reveal perfectly with this verse, reveal that we're gonna make a huge difference and to continue to be moving forward in Kainos. So here's what happened in Kainos just a couple weeks ago we had. First of all, we had 700 new cards that came in to making commitments. Can we just go crazy for that for a second? Wow. Out of that 700, 198 of those people 
were brand new. They've never given to our church in the history of our church. They've never given. We have no record of them giving. 198 brand new. Here's where I want you to go crazy in a second. That brings the grand total of brand new people that have never given to our church. We love this. Here's why we love this. It's discipleship. It's discipleship. It's hard, if you're one of these brand new givers, it's hard to step out and to give. Now, I've been giving for 35 plus years now. It's I'm scared not to give, right? I I'm, 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 don't want to not give. But that first step is a really hard step. So here's what the grand total is. With these 198, also adding what we've already got, we have now, we have broken 1,000 brand new givers, 1,062. Can we just go crazy for those folks? Absolutely awesome. And man, if you're a longtime church giver and goer, man, doesn't this give you encouragement that the church will continue and God's still at work and God's moving in great ways? It's so, so encouraging. I love that. So that comes down. Our goal was to raise $110 million. That's a lot of money. Um, that is our compassion, which is missional stuff. That's our commission, which is our budget for two years. And that um, is also our community that we're doing stuff all throughout our community to help even further the gospel in our, our city, our nation, our world. So we were shooting for 110 million at the midway point. And instead of that, drum roll, here we go, 112 million dollars coming in. How about that? Wow. That is incredible, absolutely incredible. So man, let's be faithful. I mean, we can't spend pledges, right? We spend actually real money. So it's gotta be able to, to keep going forward. But man, this is such a fun thing. This is a revealing, isn't it? In the, in the dark, dark world. And then the church shows up and says, man, we're giving some money. We're giving through the church, not to the church. We wanna see God move because we've got a gospel because the light of the world has come to planet earth. Why do you think a star led the wise men to where it was? Because he's the light in the darkness. And so in this place of groaning, there's also a place of salvation and celebration. I don't know what your groan is. Your groan could be a lost relationship. Your groan could be pain, physical pain. Your groan could be financial issues. Your groan could be the state of the world. We all groan on that. There's a lot of things to groan about. But I want to reveal to you a God who is involved and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to planet earth. And that little baby in the manger is not just a cute, sweet little story to go shopping around. It is the Savior of the world come to planet Earth to meet us in the midst of our groaning. There's a mighty counselor that is closer than a brother. How awesome is that? Let's look at our third Christmas present that we have in this broken world. It's found in verse 24 and 25. Now watching this, we've already used the word hope before. We've seen anticipation before, but watch this word hope just pop up over and over in verse 24 and 25. Here's what it says. Now in this hope, we are saved, but hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait anticipation for it with patience. Here's your third Christmas gift from heaven. I've given you, Paul's given us, God's given us, to embrace the gift of perspective, to understand the gift of, per, of frustration, anticipation. And then our final one is to celebrate the gift of hope. Celebrate the gift of hope. He says, there's hope in this fallen world of futility. I've sent my son and you now have hope. You're hoping in what you haven't seen. He's talking about salvation in Christ, going to heaven, knowing Christ is a, a true relationship in your heart. Now, here's the difference. Let me, let me illustrate it. It's not, oh, I hope I'm going to heaven. I hope I'm saved. It's I hope in Jesus Christ that he is my only hope. I'm standing on the rock and I'm going to heaven because all my hope has been placed in him. Do you see the difference? One is like this, I don't know. I'm not sure. I hope it all works out. And the other is a confidence, 
a depth, a strength. Now here's the deal. We are hoping as believers. I have never seen Jesus Christ face to face. I have never seen heaven. You haven't either. And I'm hoping by believing with good authority on the word of God and knowing Christ is in my life, I'm placed all my hope, but my hope is not a, huh? it's a confidence, a confident expectation in things unseen. So I can walk with a different perspective, realizing the frustration brings anticipation because I'm hoping in the Savior named Jesus. Do you see why Romans 8 is just awesome? Absolutely incredible. And that hope means we can go through the battles of this world, the chaos of this world, the wars of this world with a perspective of trusting in Jesus. You know, this time of year, we uh, have these kind of unveilings of what was your Spotify wrap up? You know, what were the songs you listened to the most for the year? What took place this year? We'll have all those. I love the, the little documentaries they do at the end of the year where it's like, this is what happened in 2022 and they do a wrap up of it. And, um, and so they, those are just interesting type of things. Well, the wrap up, I wanna give you a little wrap up, an interesting thing. The wrap up of this year, if you were to look at the Bible app, which most of us have on our phone, Of 303 million app searches in the Bible app this year, what do you think the most searched for words were? Anxiety, healing, and love. That doesn't surprise me one bit because we live in a hopeless, even hateful at times culture, right? So people are searching for it. Not only that, the number one verse that was shared this year was Isaiah 41, verse 10, that says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. That was the number one shared verse this year was don't be afraid, God's with you. Doesn't surprise me, does it surprise you? Because there's a hope that we need and there's an unveiling of the people of God, of the work of God in our particular church, that there's an unveiling that there is hope. It's like, a, it's like an artwork that, that's covered in brown paper and skyrockets go off and you unveil it by pulling off the brown paper to avail, uh, reveal this masterpiece that God has painted. So I just tell you this, there's gifts a perspective, and yes, life is frustrating and life hurts deeply, not just tritely as we groaned about, deeply it hurts. But there's hope in the manger, on the cross, in the empty tomb, in your heart, and one day when we see Jesus Christ face to face in heaven, there's hope, confident expectation in something that will happen in the future. That's what Christian hope is. Not, I hope... It's real. And that hope changes things, doesn't it? Last little illustration I want to give you. One of the big hit songs of this Christmas season, and you'll hear it a bunch of times, and I want you to to know about it so when you hear it, you can go, okay, I get it, is I'll Be Home for Christmas. It's a classic song. It was written uh, by a lady named Kim Gannon and Walter Kent, and you've never heard their names before, because when you think of I'll Be Home for Christmas, you think of Bing Crosby. That's who you think of. They shopped this song to a bunch of people, and nobody would take the song. They all said it was too sad. It's like, it's just too sad. And Bing Crosby said, well, I'll sing it. And so he recorded it in October, October 1st, 1943, which was right in the midst of World War II, Right? So in the midst of World War II, he records, I'll be home for Christmas. And Bing Crosby would do a lot of USO things. He's one of the heroes of USO, where they would go and encourage the troops on the, on the battlefields. And they loved him and they would beg for him to sing, I'll be home for Christmas. Even when it wasn't Christmas, they would beg, please sing, I'll be home for Christmas. And so they recorded it in a radio show. It's called the Craft Music Hall Radio Show. And it was released by the United States War Department to the Army and to the Navy on uh, December, see if I can find the date, December 7th, 1944. So after Pearl Harbor, it was December 41, December 7th, 1944. They released it and the soldiers all 
are singing and being encouraged by this song. Can I show you a picture of some of our World War II soldiers that we have so much gratitude for? Standing around the Christmas tree on the battlefield, singing together, I'll be home for Christmas. If only in my dreams, right? You know the song. I'll be home for Christmas. It was hope for them of another place out of this battlefield called earth. They'd be home with mama's cooking again. They'd be home around that table again. And I tell you, Christian, as you go through the battlefield of this planet earth, there is a home in heaven for you through Jesus Christ. And you may be like my grandmother and you got more friends in heaven than you do on earth. Or your best friend is in heaven, no longer on earth. And you're moving with frustration and with groaning, with tears and with hurts and with ants at the picnic, but you know that there's a perspective that's different and that frustration will bring anticipation of heaven and that anticipation brings great hope of an expectation that Jesus Christ, and so you and I will be home one day for Christmas to see that baby named Jesus, who's the savior of the world. That's the gift. And I submit to you, that's better than anything the mall can provide because it gets to the soul. What's your groan? Would you lay it at the feet of Christ? What's your heartache? Will you give it to Jesus? Do you need a perspective change to understand what God's at work in your life, what he's doing? You may never know completely what he's doing, but you can still walk faithfully with him in the mystery. Let's groan towards heaven and let God do his work on this Christmas season. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are so good. You're the GPS of all GPS. You're the map of all maps. And you groaned on a cross on our behalf so that we could be assured of heaven when the groanings would cease. As Romans 15 says, you are the God of hope. And so we hope in you, God. And as we sing about hope, as we see hope all around our world during this Christmas time, we come not biting our nails wondering, we come with confident expectation of a future reality of heaven. And we place all our hope in you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior at Siena, Cyprus, downtown, digital family, we'll put it in the chat with the host. Come to know Jesus, trust him, ask him to forgive your sins and live in your heart. Let him be your savior, not just the savior of the world. Place your hope for salvation in him. Pray that right where you are. Just say, Jesus, I want you to save me. I want you to forgive my sins. I want to be a Christian. If you're a believer in Jesus, would you just take your deepest groan this morning and just say, Lord, I groan towards heaven with that. Give it to you. Use it in me love you more, follow you more closely. Father, thank you for what you're doing in our church. It's not about money. It's about discipleship and difference making. And we just thank you, God. Thank you for Romans 8. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.